So you might have seen these small one-handed battery chainsaws and wondered if they're any good. Or just cheap nasty rubbish. In this video I'm going to find out. First, a couple of things I need to point out right from the beginning. 1. This video is not sponsored. I bought this saw with my own money. Not very much money either. £50 sterling delivered. That's about half what I spent on my last cordless drill. Nobody is paying or otherwise persuading me to say anything one way or the other. These are my own impartial opinions. 2. When it comes to chainsaws, I actually do know what I'm talking about. I even have a certificate to prove it. I've worked with chainsaws my whole adult life. I currently own three professional saws. They're old and well used now, but they got that way because they've lasted a long time. Partly because I've looked after them, but mainly because they were built to last and to do the job they were intended for. I've also owned cheaper saws that I no longer own. So you might be wondering if I already own three petrol saws, why would I even want one of these in the first place? Well, it's about having the appropriate tool for the job. Sometimes you just need to do a quick five minute job that would be beyond one of these, but doesn't really need one of these. Petrol saws are great for speed and power and can get a lot done in a short time. But by the time I've put on all the protective gear and put in the fuel and oil, I could already be finished with one of these. Plus I then have to clean and put everything away afterwards. And another plus. This is almost silent compared to a noisy two-stroke, which can be a big consideration if you don't want to annoy the neighbours. <laughs> Let's get started then. I bought this on eBay. I'm not going to link to the listing as there are so many identical ones and the one I bought from may have gone now. It's worth pointing out that there are also other types of mini chainsaw, some even cheaper than this one but some of the claims in the descriptions appear very dodgy. The type I bought is sold as an 800 watt, 8 inch cutting length and comes with one battery. It arrived in this very plain box. So what's inside? A slim user manual, guide bar, that's the battery. There was also a small spanner stuck to the packaging I didn't see. A screwdriver, this thing, charger, that's the chain, quarter inch pitch, the smallest size you can get, and the saw body. There was also a small file sulking quite rightly in the side of the box. More on that later. Very plasticky, but doesn't look terrible. This is the charger. It says charger on it in case you weren't sure. A 21 volt battery. The first thing to do is put the battery on charge while I check out the other bits. The batteries are apparently compatible with Makita ones, but I don't have one to try. There is no type of safety interlock at all. With the battery in, just press the trigger and this thing goes. This is quite a major omission. Even petrol saws have a safety interlock which stops the trigger being pressed unless your hand is on the handle. And with a petrol saw, it's quite obvious when it's running. Under the cover, it's pretty basic. This saw has no chain oiling system. It supposedly has a specially hardened chain that's designed to run without oil. 
More likely, the chain runs so slowly that they think they can get away without oiling it, and it will last as long as the rest of the saw, which it probably will. These studs feel like they are just ordinary bolts pushed through holes in the casing. The chain tensioner is the most simple old school design imaginable. There's a little backlash here, but not excessive. I imagine it has a pair of bevel gears inside, similar to an angle grinder. The chain cover is entirely plastic. This little hook on the end looks like it's supposed to be a chain catcher. Its job is to catch the chain if it breaks or falls off the guide bar, stopping it whipping round into your hand, or flying off the front of the saw like some ninja weapon. Being plastic, I can't see this working more than once. They are normally metal and replaceable in case of damage. This is the chain catcher on one of my bigger saws. You can see it's done its job a couple of times. The chain is also directly in line with my knuckles and there's no extended guard on the handle for extra protection. This is a basic safety feature that almost all saws have, and I can't imagine it would cost any more to add. The guide bar does look reasonable quality. It has a sprocket nose, and the edges are hardened. It does have the normal oil passages for chain lubrication, even though the saw doesn't use them. I expect they've just used an already commonly available bar. The chain is one quarter inch pitch. That's defined as the average distance between two rivets. Since they're not spaced evenly, the most common chain size is 3 8 of an inch, but there's also 0 0.325, 0 0.404 and even up to 3 quarters of an inch for heavy machinery. You may have noticed I'm talking in imperial units, which I normally avoid, being strictly a metric kind of person. But when it comes to chainsaws and wood, that's just how things seem to be measured, even today. Most chains are made from soft steel, so it's quick and easy to sharpen with a thin but very hard chrome plating on top, which makes up the cutting edge. It's easy to see the chrome plating on this 3 8 chain, especially as the rest of it is quite rusty. The chain supplied with this saw has no chrome plating. The teeth do have a blue coloration, which could indicate heat treating, so maybe they're not lying about it being a hardened chain. It doesn't feel any harder than a regular chain though. It took about three hours to charge the battery. There's no variable speed with this. It's either on or off. There's no chain break either but it does seem to stop fairly quickly when I release the trigger. So maybe there's some electronic braking of the motor. Here, I forgot about the lack of safety interlocks. I should really be doing this with the battery off. This is why this type of chain tensioner isn't used much these days. It's very awkward, especially with a supplied screwdriver. With a longer screwdriver, I was able to correctly adjust the chain without too much trouble.
The manual seems to suggest it's a brushless motor. But I don't think it is. I'm getting the distinctive smell of new carbon brushes, and I haven't seen this claim online or anywhere else. Now, about the tools supplied with this saw. Except possibly for the spanner, you're best off just throwing them away. This has to be the poorest excuse for a file I've ever encountered. Can you see those teeth? It looks more like a spiral pattern that's just been pressed into it. This will not sharpen the chain. I don't think they even expect you to try. Just buy a new one each time it goes blunt. To demonstrate just how bad this is, look at this. There's no funny business here. That really was one stroke of the file. The good file is completely untouched. I'd recommend buying a quality file and a holder for it. You should never use a bare file on its own. Sharpening is quick and easy. There are plenty of tutorials on YouTube. There's one more part of the saw I haven't attached yet. It won't actually fit because of this piece of flashing from the moulding process. This is supposed to be some sort of guard that stops you cutting with the top of the guide bar, but it's very flappy and annoying. Using the top of the guide bar is in itself not dangerous and is actually required in certain situations, such as when cutting a branch that's in tension underneath. So this really reduces the usefulness of the saw. Because of the chain rotation, when cutting with the bottom of the bar, the saw tends to pull itself into the cut. And it's normal to let it pull itself all the way in and rest against the dogs. When cutting with the top of the bar, the saw tends to push itself back towards the operator. So an equal force must be applied to keep it in place. The danger is, if the saw comes too far back out of the cut, you risk cutting with the danger area at the tip of the bar. When this small area contacts an object, the chain has a tendency to dig in and jam rather than cut, since all the pressure is on a single tooth. When this happens, instead of the chain moving forwards, the entire saw can be thrown upwards and backwards towards the operator. This is known as a kickback, and it's the number one cause of chainsaw accidents. All trained chainsaw operators will be well aware of this danger, but a novice who's just bought one of these may not. So I presume this guard is supposed to reduce the risk of a kickback, though it doesn't actually cover much of the danger zone, or prevent you contacting something with the tip of the bar. Much better would have been something like this, but that would reduce the length of the already short bar even further, which is probably why they went with this cheap flappy thing. This is going straight in the bin with the file and screwdriver. But maybe instead, I could use this screw to attach a GoPro or something. Before I do any actual cutting tests with this, you probably want to see inside it as much as I do. I don't know why they put a wrist strap on it. It doesn't seem like a good way to carry a chainsaw. I can only see this causing problems. That's tight. No, it's a left hand thread of course. Nine tooth spur sprocket. Looks like sintered metal. 
there's not much to see inside. A switch, a motor, and a pair of gears. That's a brushed DC motor. There's one of the brushes. There is a decent sized sealed ball bearing on the shaft. It feels like there's one on the other side too, but I can't get it out to see. That's just a single pole on off switch. No electric braking of the motor. So friction is the only thing slowing this down when you let go of the trigger. As I suspected. The numbers 4.8 indicate that these are the weakest types of bolts made, basically mild steel. Here is a quick and dirty way to measure the power of a DC motor. My test leads have a resistance of 0.4 ohms. Across the motor measures 0.7, which means its resistance is 0.3 ohms. The supply is 21 volts. Using Ohm's law, 21 divided by 0.3 gives 70 amps. This would be the current the motor draws when stalled. DC motors produce their maximum power at half this current and half the no-load RPM. So divide 70 amps by 2 and multiply it by the voltage to give the power. 735 watts. Not far off the 800 watts claimed. And if I had a more accurate meter, it might even be closer. But note that that's the input electrical power, not the mechanical power output, which will be considerably less. So what's inside the battery? There's some sort of charge controller and cell management circuitry, which is good. Ten cells. They're marked 1.5 amp hours and wired in series parallel. Five lots of two cells. This would add up to the three amp hours claimed, but at a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts per cell, this is what most people would call an 18 volt battery. Calling it 21 volts is being slightly optimistic. Fully charged with a supplied charger, it measures just over 20 volts. If you were to use the Makita 18 volt batteries instead, I imagine the performance would be exactly the same. Here I'm running the saw with the chain cover removed so I can measure the speed of the chain. Obviously this is not recommended. Two thousand two hundred RPM. The sprocket has nine teeth. Nine drive links of the chain measure one hundred and fourteen millimeters. That works out to four point two meters per second. Again, not far off from the five meters per second claimed in the manual. And once run in, it might even go a bit faster. But compare that to a regular chainsaw which will have a chain speed of 20 to 25 meters per second. And that will give you some idea how this saw is going to perform. It definitely feels different. Rather than slicing through, it more nibbles its way along. You can almost feel every tooth take a bite. Less like this. More like this. It does cut through small branches reasonably quickly, but what about something bigger? bigger. This is a 6 inch green log. How does that compare to a petrol saw? No surprise really.
but how many 6 inch logs can I cut through on one battery? Fourteen and a half. And after that, my hand was starting to hurt and I needed a rest. That might not seem like a lot of cutting, but if they had been two inch branches, I think I could easily have done over a hundred in the same time. I've been applying chain oil directly to the bar every few cuts, since I don't really trust their claims that it doesn't need lubrication. Do I really need to do this? Possibly not. But it can't hurt and should make the chain, bar and sprocket last longer. With an 8 inch bar, it should be possible to cut through a log twice that diameter. But will this saw do it? This is a very dry cherry log, just under a foot diameter. Considerably bigger than the bar. That wasn't a lot of fun, and I was pushing on the saw perhaps harder than I should, but it did do it. This is really beyond what this saw is practical for. It's much better suited to small branches in the 2 to 3 inch range. The problem with a one handed saw is what to do with the other hand. You shouldn't use it to apply extra force to the saw, though it is tempting. And if you block these vents, the motor is likely to burn out. I find myself wanting to use my spare hand to support what I'm cutting, but this is a bad habit. It might be okay at a safe distance, but how far is safe? Earlier I mentioned kickback. I'm now going to deliberately cause a kickback to see how bad it is. Because of the low speed of the chain, I'm really not anticipating it to be much. That's not bad at all. If you weren't expecting it, it might frighten you a little. But it's certainly not going to rip the saw out of your hand, unless you are barely holding on to it. So what's the verdict? It is very cheap and cheerful, as you'd expect, but actually quite fun and surprisingly useful, being so convenient just to grab and get to work. It does have its limitations, and a few safety issues, but as long as you don't expect too much from it, I think it's worth every penny of what little I paid for it. As for how long it will last, that remains to be seen. It probably depends on how much use it gets, but if it's only a year of occasional to moderate use, I won't be too disappointed. And when it does break, I may well spend a bit more on a similar but slightly more capable and safer replacement. <laughs>